Barber is a best-selling author and founder of Lighthouse Catholic Media. Jesse Romero is a retired law enforcement officer, a former kickboxing champion with a master's degree in theology. And together, they share a passion for evangelization and PhDs in common sense. You're listening to The Terry and Jesse Show on Immaculate Heart Radio. To join the show, call 888-914-9149. Here's Terry and Jesse. Welcome to SWAT Training, Spiritual Weapons and Tactics, with the Full Contact Catholic uh, show host. What does Jesus have to say to us today? Pull up a chair, pull up something to drink, because there's nothing more important in a 24-hour day than what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has to say to us. In fact, here's what he said today at Daily Mass at the Gospel. Luke chapter 9, verse 57 to 62. It reads, As Jesus and his disciples were proceeding on their journey, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus answered him, Foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. And to another he said, follow me. I want to stop right there. Follow me. He's saying that to every one of you out there. Every single one of you that's listening to this radio program, Jesus is saying, follow me. He continues in the gospel. He said, but he replied, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. But he answered him, let the dead bury their dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to my family at home. Jesus answered him, No one who sets a hand to the plow and looks to what was left behind is fit for the kingdom of God. The gospel of the Lord. Two commentaries I want to make. I like that last uh, sentence. No one who sets a hand to the plow and looks to what was left behind is fit for the kingdom of God. You know, there's a little song that they sing in the charismatic renewal in the Catholic Church. It goes like this. I'm not going to sing it. I don't want you to turn off the radio. (laughs) It goes, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. That's what he's saying today to all of us. Absolutely. I just kind of think when Jesus said the plow, I think we could use the steering wheel. Don't take your hands off the steering wheel. Jesus, stay focused. And I think that's a powerful message for us because of the distractions of the world today, the world, the devil, and the flesh. So I think it's a powerful message to take into the day-to-day, and I think it's wonderful that we can take the readings of Holy Mass. If you can't make it to Mass, at least read the readings. They're all available on the Internet. So I think that's something that we all can take heed for. Look on verse 59 of today's Gospel reading. Where Jesus says, to another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. You're saying, man, these are hard it's words. Hardcore. Jesus is saying, <laughs> man, you know what? Follow me. That's Let the dead bury their dead. Did you know that for the Jewish people in the Old Testament, they had a sacred re- responsibility to honor their parents, obviously, at the fourth commandment. But they had yep. a duty also to, to, to give a proper burial to their parents, just like we do. But notice that Jesus is saying here in verse 59 that our duty as Christian disciples to follow him is even more sacred than burying our parents. That's what he's saying. Your duty to follow me is more sacred than than burying your mom and dad, as important as that is. And also, you know, in verse 62 where it says, Jesus said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom. This reminds me of Jesus is telling us right now, he's telling you, that he's very demanding. And what do I mean by that? If you go back to the story of Elijah in the book of 1 Kings 19, Elijah permitted Elisha, his disciple, to to say goodbye to his parents and give them a kiss. But Jesus is even more demanding than Elijah here in verse 62. He's saying, you know what? Uh, You can't postpone your commitment to the kingdom of God. This, This is more important than anything you're going to do even family relations. So uh, these are serious words from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Got to have our priorities in line, right? And so following Jesus is number one. And I might add something. Have you ever had a situation where a family member tried to pull you away from God? I think you've had one. I've had one. 
And I've had to tell my family member, no, God first. So this is a powerful reading. We have a question of the day that came in today that uh, that just is about someone being afraid of death, and they asked, the, can they help? Can you help them? What are your thoughts? And then I have a story that kind of handles that question really well. Yep, uh, Terry Jesse, I'm afraid of death. Can you help me? That's the email question. Yeah, uh, I would I would take a look at what the Bible says, and Saint Paul answers that question. He says in First Corinthians fifteen fifty five, Saint Paul says, and he he could only say these words because he lived in a state of grace. He says, "O oh, death." Where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Notice what St. Paul did with death. He mocked death. Why did he do that? Because he lived in a state of grace. So he was fearless of death. But on a practical level, I think here's a story that will help you out as well. I was told one day this story about there was a sick man who turned to his doctor. He knew that the doctor was Catholic. And as a sick man who had a terminal illness... He was preparing to leave the, doc- the, the doctor's office. He said, Doctor, I know you're Catholic. I- I'm afraid to die. Doctor, can, can you tell me what lies, what lies on the other side of death? And very quietly, the Catholic doctor says, I don't know. And, and the patient said, You don't know? You're a Catholic. You don't know what's on the other side of death? And then the doctor said this. The doctor looked at the patient, and he was holding the handle of his door, and on the other side of the door... He heard a, a scratching and a whining sound. So the doctor opened the door, and it was his wife with his dog. The dog sprang into the room and leapt onto the doctor's lap. And the doctor hugged his dog, and the doctor turned to his patients, and he said, Did you notice my dog right now? He goes, Yeah. He goes, My dog's never been to my, to my, uh, to this, to this, uh, to my, uh, to the doctor's room. He's never been here before. And so the dog didn't know what was inside. But the dog knew one thing. He heard my voice, so he knew that I was behind the door. He knew his master was behind the door. He says, that's kind of like what death is like, the doctor said to his patient. He goes, I haven't been to the other side, but I know who's there. My master's there. His name's Jesus, and that's good enough for me. That's a beautiful story. I have one more story about not being afraid of death. There was a gentleman. See if this relates to you. The gentleman says, I have difficulty in praying When I go to church, I'm distracted. Have you ever been like that? I have. So this gentleman was at a parish mission, and the priest said, Hey, if you ever have any issues about your faith, come see me this afternoon. I'm available because this is going to be a whole week parish mission. So this man who's been having problems praying went over to see the priest. And the priest said, Yeah, what can I do to help you? And he said, Well, Father, I'm really distracted. I can't really believe that, you know, God hears my prayers. I mean, is he really up there? And... I feel like I'm distracted. So the priest said, okay, here's my technique that I want you to do. When you go to pray at home, put up a chair next to your chair. Envision that Jesus Christ is sitting there, and you're going to have a friendly conversation with him when you pray. So use your imagination to envision Jesus being there. See if that helps you. Wow, that changed his whole life, right? I mean, this guy was like, he became fervent because prayer life, generated energy it generated focus in his life now he could actually pray properly well now move the clock up 20 years and that same priest was now at a hospital where people needed his assistance and 20 years later that man was dying in a hospital and when the priest saw his name he said i think i remember this guy from a previous parish so he went to go see him and sure enough it was the same guy but this time This man was dying, and he was so confident. He said, Father, I'm going to go see Jesus for real because the doctor says my heart's failing. I'm so excited. What? Okay. So then here's what happens. The daughter comes to visit the the dad for like two or three days because she knows I'm not going to be able to see my dad anymore. But he had a practice. He would put a chair next to his hospital bed. The the, the, uh, I would say their sisters that were the nurses said, Are you expecting a visitor? Yes. And uh, every day he envisioned Jesus being in that chair while he was in the hospital bed. Well, the daughter went out to get something to eat. And my golly, uh, when the daughter came back, the man had died. But what was interesting is the man had his head laying in the chair. And the daughter didn't understand why dad would put his head in the chair. When the father came back, father explained that your dad died in the lap of Jesus. So what is the message? Don't be afraid. Envision when you pray that you're right there with Jesus Christ so that be excited about every day 
you're preparing for eternity. And when you have that attitude, when you die to yourself daily, when it does come, you'll be ready. So I hope those two stories prepared me, prepared you, so that because life is short and eternity is forever. Every day before you go to bed, when you say your act of contrition and you do your examination of conscience and then your act of contrition and say a prayer that if this is my last night, Jesus, I want to be with you for all eternity. And this is how we prepare for it. Every time we go to bed, it's kind of like dying, isn't it? This, uh, we're, we're, you're listening to SWAT training right now, spiritual weapons and tactics. <laughs> That's what we're doing. This is SWAT training. This is the Lord's Gym. Uh, hey, I blogged uh, Fulton Sheen's Daily Reflection today. You can read it. Go to jesseromero.com. He basically says today, the last sentence of what he says today is called Mary and the Good Samaritan. He, he says this. He talks about the month of transfiguration, the fact that we have this ecstasy with God sometimes. But then he talks also about being in the valley, being down there in Jerusalem, seeing Jesus crucified. So Venerable Fulton Sheen says, We cannot always remain on the mountain of transfiguration. We have to go down into the valley. There is the ecstasy, but there are also the problems. The two have to be kept together. So Venerable Fulton Sheen is saying that the Christian life has highs, Sometimes we're in the Mount of Transfiguration, there's lows. Sometimes we're there on Calvary. He says both of them go together. we got to deal with it because we've got Jesus, and we know we're going to get through this. If you want to get our, our CD giveaway, it's the Catholic Care Package, the first CD on confession. You can call 877-526-215. When we come back, you're going to hear about a businessman putting up a sign that's going to blow you away. We'll be back in a moment. Back to the Terry and Jesse Show on Immaculate Heart Radio. Want to join the conversation? Call 888-914-9149. Here's Terry and Jesse. Way to go, uh, Dairy Queen owner. Have you heard this story <laughs> about an independent owner of a Dairy Queen of a franchise? Obviously, he's, he's a Christian, either Catholic or Protestant. I don't know. But, you, you know, he's not afraid of the... What, what you would call the social justice uh, keyboard warriors uh, on the left who basically scour who scour the country trying to look for ways to tell people that, and, and post online that I'm offended, I'm offended. And this, this I'm offended generation that walks around with a keyboard using social media to try to bully businesses. Well, this one business owner of a private dairy queen named Kevin Schumann he wasn't intimidated. Uh, uh, a couple of, uh, as the article calls them, snowflakes. So what's a snowflake? Let, let me let me define what a snowflake is. That's somebody who's yeah, that's a young person, kind of a, kind of a young college kid that goes to a college where uh, you know it's a safe space and and the only thing that's allowed in that college is leftist uh, progressive dialogue. And so a, a snowflake would be somebody that if you would say something that they disagree with. They would be offended, and they would take right to social media, and they would try to uh, tar and feather you. So this this owner, guess what? He's created quite a stir on social media because in his Dairy Queen, he's put a sign with the majority of us Americans. We'd say, right on, awesome, way to go. But, you know, some snowflakes, some liberal progressives, they find that offensive. Here's what the sign says on his Dairy Queen. Okay, it says this. Okay, this restaurant is politically incorrect. We have been known to say Merry Christmas, Happy Easter, God bless America, and I give away free ice cream Sundays to veterans on Veterans Day. The bottom of the sign says in large letters, In God We Trust. Now, this sign's been posted for four years uh, in, his, uh, in his private dairy queen of Mr. Schumann, and nobody seems to have a problem with it. And uh, again, but some of these young people that... that so the, the, are known as the snowflake generation. The, their their feelings are very hurt, so they're taking to the to the media and they're complaining about this. And Mr. Schumann, he was interviewed by CBS Channel 58. He said, "Look at, I feel that the sign in my business, it's appropriate to hang in terms of being transparent, because these are my views. I support God and I support my country. Here's my take, my analysis of this." What are these young people trying to do by uh, by browbeating this business owner on social media? They're using Sal Alinsky methods. 
Selaminski wrote yep, a book ahead, called Rules for Radicals. He yep. was a Marxist who has been his, – his book is basically the playbook used today by the mainstream media and the Democrat Party. Rule number 12 is what these young people are using to browbeat this business owner. Rule number 12 says this. Pick a target, freeze it, personalize it, and polarize it. Identify a responsible individual. Ignore attempts to shift or spread the blame. That's exactly what they're doing to this man, but he'll have nothing He'll have nothing of it. He's not intimidated. Good for you, Mr. Schumann. God bless you. Yeah, I'm going to call him Kevin, and I want to thank him for his witness, because this is what the Second Vatican Council says about us laity. We're supposed to sanctify the temporal order. And so we, whether we're at school or at work or at the ballpark, we're going to have our Christian values in season and out. But I like what he says. He says, business is good. He says to the CBS reporter, he said, I posted on the door. You know, people can see it before they walk into my store. If they if they don't agree with it, they have free choice to say, you know what, I'm going to go down the street and buy my ice cream somewhere else. And uh, I think that's kind of neat that uh, he sees it that way. He says, look, I'm going to wear my faith on my shoulder. And um, and if they don't want my business, they'll go somewhere else. But I'm willing to take a stand. I think if we had more people like Kevin today, things like abortion, same sex marriage, uh, wouldn't it be uh, aff- affected in our country because Christians would stand up and say, not on my watch. So I want to give him credit. And I don't know about you, but I think that if more businesses said, look, I'm going to wear my faith when I do business, I think, hey, can you imagine how many businesses would want to do business with a Christian businessman who keeps his promise? Because, you know, that's one of the big problems of business. People just say it and they don't mean it. So I think we have to have the integrity to stand up for Jesus at the workplace or at home. And I want to say kudos to him. But what do you think? You, can you apply this to your life, whether you have a small business, whether you work in a, a, a government agency, whether you go to the park? I think this story has many legs for me and for you. Also, do you realize that the word progressive is found in the New Testament? Because the word progressive is a synonym for... I know sometimes people say... Jesse, don't use the word liberal on Catholic radio. I'm saying, what? Are you kidding me? What did the Bible say? Let let, let me me define it first of all. If you go to Webster's Dictionary, Webster's will tell you that a synonym for progressive is liberal. It means the same thing. It's like saying car and automobile. It's the same thing, liberal and progressive. And so the word liberal may not be in the Bible. I agree. But the word progressive is in the Bible. It's in 2 John, verse 9. Here's what it says. I'm reading right from the New American Bible. This is the translation used at every Holy Mass in the U.S. It says this, quote, Anyone who is so progressive as not to remain in the teaching of the Christ does not have God. Whoever remains in the teaching has the Father and the Son. Did you notice? The Bible condemns progressive thought. Progressive is another way of saying liberal thought. And so I applaud Kevin Schumann, who was standing up. See, this a, a young lady from Oregon tried to shame him on social media. Her name's Ashley Coleman. She went on Facebook and tried to, you know, she wrote, I find this extremely offensive and started whining on and on on social media <laughs> to try to shame him. Well, guess what? Pretty quickly, thousands of people started commenting on this sign at this, at this uh, Dairy Queen. And guess what? Ashley Coleman, this uh, this uh, progressive uh, woman from Oregon, uh, she was sorely mistaken because, in fact, most people were rallying around Kevin Schumann and saying, way to go, and giving him props. Here's what he says. Here's his comment, what he said on social media. He says, there's nothing wrong with anything that was said on this sign, but leave it to a liberal to be triggered by it. America's a melting pot. That, d- that does not mean we need to abandon our customs for other people's feelings. If they do not like that this place says Merry Christmas, they're free to go to a place that says Happy Holidays and so (laughs) forth. Being offended by something does not mean they should force other people to see it their way. It just simply means that is their views. Too many people that seem simple enough, but thanks to the liberal indoctrination, these entitled leftists believe everyone must bend to them. 
it will take time to fix this mess, but until we cannot bend to these liberals, we must continue forging on. My hat's off to Kevin Schumann. That's all I can say. My hat's off to Kevin, too. I'm wondering if he's a Catholic because there's five effects of the sacrament of confirmation, okay? And one of those effects Kevin just used, it's called defend the faith, gives us a special strength to spread and defend the faith as true witnesses of Christ. See, he just stood up for Jesus by saying Merry Christmas. No, no, you can't say Merry Christmas. Why not? I'm a Christian. I can say Merry Christmas, Happy Easter. And so that now, right now, we're going to talk about, right now, you, if you're confirmed, you have five effects of the sacrament of confirmation. And that makes us all soldiers for Christ. What? You haven't heard that term? Yes, we're soldiers for Christ. Because here's what I'm going to do before I turn it to Jesse and talk about these five effects of the sacrament of confession. We have the church militant. That's us, you and me. Church triumphant in heaven. Church suffering in purgatory. Right now, everybody listening? Yes, I'm talking to you. You're in the church militant. So step up to the plate because you've been confirmed. You're going to have five effects that we're going to go over and I think this should encourage you to step up to Jesus right now. By the way, I'm going to take this five effects this Saturday, October 7th, to Sacred Heart Catholic <laughs> Church in Palm Desert, California. I'm going to be doing a men's Good. conference from uh, 7 a.m. to 12 noon. I'm going to be giving two talks in English from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. I'll be doing the exact same men's talks in Spanish. That's Sacred Heart Church, Palm Desert, this Saturday, October 7th. I'll be taking my Sacrament of Confirmation gifts over to your parish. Terry, where are you going to be at? Hey, well, I'm going to be actually on October 26th. They want me to give a good plug to Incarnation Catholic Church in Glendale, California. I'm going to be speaking on the Beacon of Light, the Grace and Hope. It's an evening reflection at, from 7 to 8.30 at Incarnation Catholic Church in Glendale, California on the 26th of October. So the five things that you receive in confirmation, and again, I think Kevin Schumann, I'm thinking he yeah. may be a Catholic Christian because, I think boy, so too. oh, boy, uh, you, <laughs> see, uh, you see all five effects of confirmation in the way he handled the situation. Well, number one, the first thing that happens, it completes your baptismal grace as a sacrament of confirmation. So baptism makes you a child of God, and it's the sacrament of confirmation. It roots us more deeply as children of God, and we grow now in sonship. So we go from children of God to soldiers of Christ. Terry? Absolutely. Number two, we're going to go gifts of the of the Holy Spirit increases the gifts of the Holy Spirit in us. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety and fear of the Lord. See, here's the thing that I want to ask you. Do we fear the world more than if we offend God? I think with the Holy Spirit and the confirmation, we get to have it prioritized. We don't fear what man can do. We fear what God can do. So that's the preparation I think all of us need today. Number hey, three. Jesse, get hey, number three. The, last, uh, the sacrament three. of confirmation, it unites, us more, it's, it, it unites us closer to Jesus. That's the bottom line, and it makes yep. us fully Catholic. Hey, on the next segment, oh, you don't want to miss this. You don't want to miss this. Have you ever watched an exorcist movie and say, why do priests ask demons to reveal their names? Yep, we're going to answer that question on the next segment. Why do exorcists ask demons to reveal their names? And if you want to get that interview with an exorcist, call 877-526-2151. We'll be back in a moment. You're listening to The Terry and Jesse Show on Immaculate Heart Radio. To join the show... Call 888-914-9149. Here's Terry and Jesse. This is SWAT training. Yep, spiritual weapons and tactics. You got your, uh, hey guys, you got your AR-15. You're saying, what, AR-15? Yep, that's the rosary, the holy rosary. That's your AR-15. Hey, we've got Steve Com from San Jose, California. Steve, you're on, go. Hi, so I mentioned um, a comment on the fact uh, about the franchise owner of um, the Dairy Queen, that mm -hmm. um, about any restaurant you go to, especially if it's um, Buddhist, they have a statue of Buddha. If you go to an Indian restaurant, they'll have a statue of a Hindu god. And additionally, if you, where I work, there are people who are Sikhs who wear their headdress, and there are of course Muslim women who wear their headdress. And then additionally, I went to the Golden State Warriors game where um, people of Hindu religion <clears throat> were doing a dance. So if it's 
not okay for a Christian to demonstrate their faith, and why not these atheists just kind of go all around the board <clears throat> and attack everything that's pretty much the core of our First Amendment. So Steve, I think you made a, you made a very good point, and my comment is, and uh, is this that uh, anti-Catholicism is the only one that really we can talk about. The others, if it was a Muslim or it was a Christian, you know, or a Protestant or or, or Buddhist, or you're Buddhist, right. Buddhist, that's okay. Yeah. yeah, Buddhist, it's okay. But Catholicism or Christianity, that's not okay. And so we have a free country, and I have no problem with uh, the Buddhists doing their thing at their restaurant. That's fine. We have a free country. But uh, like I said, why is there so much opposition to Christianity? And I think it's because there's anti-Christian people in this country. That's my take. Hey, Steve, thanks for the uh, thanks for your comment. Uh, you're spot on. It's funny yep. every time I every time I go to a Chinese restaurant, me and my wife go to a Chinese restaurant and we see the Buddha statue. Both of us immediately turn to the Buddha statue and pray the Saint Michael the Archangel prayer every time. So if you're a Catholic <laughs> and you go into a restaurant where they have the goddess Kali, you know these Indian restaurants or or the goddess yeah. Shiva or Buddha, it, it, these are these are you know the, it, there's demonic spirits that are attached to these figures. Say a St. Michael the Archangel prayer, then enjoy your meal. Hey, okay, so have you ever wondered about, you've probably watched movies, uh, The Exorcist, The Right, The Exorcism of Emily Rose, The Omen, uh, The Amityville Horror, too many, to, too many to, to count. Yeah. And have you ever wondered why, in many scenes, you have a priest who's demanding that the, he, that the demon give him his name, uh, you know the demon that's that's uh, bound to the that's possessing the victim. Have you ever wondered why? Well, an interview was done of Father Caesar Truqui. He's the exorcist of the Diocese of Chur, Switzerland. He was asked, Father, and by the way, he's a professor of exorcism over at the Regina Apostolorum Pontifical Athenaeum in Rome. So this is what he teaches exorcism over in Rome. So they asked him. Father, why do you as an exorcist ask for the demon's name? He, he says this, the ritual, he's talking about the actual book that they use with the prayers. The ritual requires it for a specific person. He says, naming something or, name, or knowing its name means having power over that thing. In fact, God gives Adam the power to name things. At the instant that the demon reveals his name to a Catholic priest, it shows that the demon has been weakened. If he doesn't, if the demon doesn't say his name to the Catholic priest, the demon still remains strong. So that's the answer. I found it fascinating. And if you want to know the four signs of possession, the same priest answers Father Caesar Truqui. It's right in the ritual. The four signs of possession are aversion towards sacred things, two, speaking in unknown or dead languages, three, having extraordinary strength that goes beyond the person's size and nature. Four, having knowledge of concealed or hidden things. Due to time, I want you to read this whole article of questions from this exorcist. You can go to the IH Radio uh, show page, the Terry and Jesse show, because I want you to hear this. I love what Pope Francis says about the devil. He says, you can't dialogue with the devil. His intellect is way too far higher than ours. So remember that when we're dealing with the demonic, no dialogue. Say your prayers. And, now, and Terry, let, just, let me, Terry, yeah, let me mention something. Jump in. You, you, yeah. Jump in. I, I asked another exorcist one day about, you know, why is that? I want to get more more theology. Yeah. So I asked yeah. Father Ch Father Chad Ripperger, who teaches exorcism here in Mundelein Seminary, and he goes, mm -hmm. Jess, he says, that's precisely what got Eve in trouble in the garden. I said, what do you mean, Father? Explain. He goes, the fact that Eve's mistake was having a conversation with Satan. He says that's what was that was her was her initial mistake because like Terry just said, because the devil's intellect is so much so much higher than any human Amen. intellect. And so Father Ripperger told me that's why a human being should never dialogue with a demon because they can manipulate you. They're deceptive. He says uh they're treacherous. They can tie you in an intellectual pretzel. He goes, and that was the, 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 the initial sin of Eve was dialoguing with Satan. That was the beginning of the fall. I found that, that uh, fascinating when he told me that. I said, well, that makes sense, Father. Yeah, another great question from an article we have on our show page is, can demons read your thoughts? 
No, demons cannot read your thoughts, but they're incapable of reading your minds, right? Rather, they rely on observing your behaviors to gain insights into your thoughts and weaknesses. This is actually what C.S. Lewis wrote in the screw tape letters, okay? The Holy Spirit can chase away these evil spirits, but only within the confines of free will. So you have to be open to letting him chase away those demons. So again, can the demon read your thoughts? No, but let's face it. Let's say you have a habit of going and looking at pornography. Guess what? The devil's going to take that and utilize that against you, and he's going to drive you to him. And here again, you have free will to say no, but the devil cannot read your thoughts, but he does follow your, your behaviors. Yeah, uh, Father Ripperger explained this to me in detail. He just basically said, demons have nothing to do all day than just to watch you. <laughs> hey, they don't sleep. Yeah. They don't get tired. They don't eat. Uh, they're not watching TV. They're not watching ESPN. They're not playing on the Internet. All they do is study you 24 hours a day, and they don't get tired. They don't sleep. Okay, They're always awake. He says, so they can guess with like 99% accuracy your next move based on the pattern of your lifestyle. So they see, oh, this guy likes to watch pornography every day at 3, at, at 3 a.m. when his wife's asleep. Or this guy likes to drink a 12-pack when he gets home every day from work. So they study your weaknesses, then they can guess your next move with a high degree of probability. But only God can read your thoughts, properly speaking, because only God knows everything. So, by well, the way, we're, if... we're, yeah, we're giving you a quick analysis. Some of you, you, there's a book that came out, it's called... An Exorcist Explains the Demonic, Father Gabriel Amor, he just passed away. It's his last yep. book. He was the Vatican Exorcist. And we're giving you five bullets from the book in case you haven't read it. That way you can say, okay, all right, I think I'll go get that book. Now I know what he's talking about. It's a good summary. And if you want an interview, if you're a bookworm or if you're a, a DVD, I've got an interview with an exorcist, a Father Jose Antonio Fortea. It's a one-hour DVD asking him questions on the demonic, you can get that for free. You just pay the shipping by calling 877-526-2151. Here's another question. And now I'm just going to make a comment. Exorcism is sacramental, right? You know what going to confession is? Yes. Let's talk about what Father has to say about going to confession. This is probably the most fascinating part of the book. I know. Okay? I, oh, it is. Yeah. Yeah. He says uh, exorcism is a sacramental. What, what does he mean by that? Okay. The rite of exorcism... It disposes you to receive the grace of the sacraments. But the rite of exorcism doesn't give you sanctifying grace. Follow what I'm saying here. This is important. Mm -hmm. Only the sacrament of confession and the seven sacraments give you sanctifying grace, the life of God in your soul. An exorcism doesn't do that. An exorcism, what it does, it predisposes you now to start receiving the sacraments. And so that's why Father Gabriel Amorth and others say, that the sacrament of confession is a hundred times more powerful than an exorcism. Because sacramentals, such as an exorcism, dispose us to receiving the grace of the sacraments. So it's easy to see how exorcism fits into this. Literally, getting rid of evil that has taken over a person's life and opening that person again to the grace of God through the sacraments. Get that? Only an exorcist can perform an exorcism, major or minor. And interestingly enough, this is kind of interesting, for those of our Orthodox brothers and sisters in Christ, guess what? Every Orthodox priest is an exorcist according to the Orthodox Church. Right in their holy orders, the Orthodox priests are all given the right of exorcist through their ordination. That's not done well, in the Latin right in our church. No. No, that's right. There are different levels of possession. I bet you've asked that question. Generally, when we think of demonic possession, we think of a full-on head spinning, you know, cussing words, slinging, possibly vomiting uh, possession we see in the media, right? But this is only the most serious form of a extraordinary action the devil takes and become possessed. A person must completely open himself to Satan to allow the evil one in. When possessed... Satan makes a person do and say as he wishes, and the person has no control. Of note here, the devil cannot possess someone's soul, only their body, unless the person consents to the possession of the soul. That's bottom line. That's what, right from Father Amorth. He's got this nailed on that. That's good stuff. Yeah, the, the only place, Father Ripperger told me that the only place where a demon 
can possess the soul is in hell. In hell, the, ah. the soul is the soul is possessed entirely. Makes sense. But yeah. on planet Earth, only the body's oh. possessed. Only the body can be possessed. And he also says this. This is something very interesting. There's two types of possessions. You got uh, normal possession here with with the four characteristics put out by the right. Then you got what's called perfect possession. I mean, uh, yeah, perfect possession, which means where somebody consents to giving his will to the demon. That's perfect possession. Maybe I'll explain that on some other show. Yeah, we're going to come back, but you can get that DVD interview with the exorcist by calling 877-526-215. When we come back, though, we're going to talk about how to deal with toxic people in your life, according to the St. Teresa of Lisieux. We'll be back in a moment. For today's giveaway, call 877-526-2151. expressed on the Terry and Jesse show are for educational purposes only. Now here's Terry and Jesse. SWAT training, spiritual weapons and tactics. You got a Bible and a rosary and Jesus in your heart. That's SWAT tra- training. Have you ever, uh, Father Amorth in his book, he talks about haunted houses. There's entire networks and TV shows dedicated to haunted houses. Father Amorth would say that Di- uh, haunted houses, they are diab- it's called diabolical infestations. In other words, these demonic disturbances on a house or places or objects or animals rather than people, that's called diabolical infestations. And that's something that's very real. It's something that's very real. Demons are attracted to evil places where suicides or homicides or or brothels, you know, former bro- or places where drugs have been sold, or the seances are practiced. Those places attract evil spirits. And and also, finally, uh, number five, the fifth point from Father Amorth's book, it says there are way there are other ways Satan can exude extraordinary influence over a person. The next most serious form of extraordinary action. Satan can take is called diabolical vexation. It's also called diabolical oppression. Some people call it, some exorcists call it vexation. Some call it oppression. It's the same thing. Okay, and this is the most numerous of cases that exorcists deal with. This is where the devil or or, or a demon actually physically hurts a person. There are burns. There's broken bones or scratches, or uh, they get pulled off their bed, and uh, they, they they have horrible nightmares. And a person opens himself up to diabolical oppression or diabolical vexation through participation in things like the Ouija board, seances, by living a life of persistent mortal sin. And the other way that the demon attacks a person is called diabolical obsession. This generally manifests itself as as strong hallucinations in the mind where the person no longer is master of his thoughts. And this can be manifest as hearing voices or seeing monstrous figures in your room or, or in, your, in, in your house or this impulse to hurt yourself or, or to hurt somebody else. This voice is telling you to hurt them. That's also called diabolical obsession. Here's the last thing I'll mention because I find this, I, I think this is kind of interesting that there's three ways that demons uh, possess a person. There's three ways. And you probably haven't heard this. I, I learned this from Father Forte years ago. In fact, it's in that CD that Terry's promoting. Uh, Father Forte says that the three the three types of possessions uh, that demons manifest. The number the first one is called. You have what's called a classy demon. What's a classy demon? Th- that that type of demon. What it does, it has the victim close their eyes, or the victim's eyes will roll bla- back into a trance. That's kind of the normal way a demon will possess a person. That's called a classy demon. The demon possess, uh, causes the person's eyes to roll back and puts them in a trance. Then you got another type of demon during possession. Father uh, Fortea says, and by the way, I'm giving all these talks this weekend, a spiritual, these talks that I'm doing right now, I'm going to be over <laughs> a Sacred Heart Church. If you want to hear this live, I'm going to give these talks live. Uh, uh, this is an area that fascinates me. Terry knows that I've, I've read every Absolutely. book on this. And I've got this yep. committed to memory. So this is just something I think God has called me to uh, to share with the body of Christ. So October 7th, I'm going to be giving these talks on spiritual warfare. 
Sacred Heart Church, Palm Desert, uh, from 7 to 12, I'll give it in English. Then from 1 to 4, I'll give these same talks in Spanish. The second type of demon that Father Forte says that, it, that possesses a person is called an, a, a purdy demon. And that demon causes the person violence and rage and anger. Uh, so this and, and this this a pretty demon is also loquacious. It's also talking, 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 trying to disrupt the exorcist during the session. And then finally, there's the third type of demon that Father Fortea talks about during possession. He he says they're called abdidi demons. Abdidi demons, and, and these demons basically what they try to do they try to hide themselves. They try to go mute or dormant, and they. They, they try not to reveal themselves at all. They remain basically asleep within the person. That's all I've got. Terry? Well, Jesse, you're talking about that interview with an exorcist, and that is actually a DVD, one-hour DVD where the interviewer, Matt Arnold, is asking Father uh, all these questions about exorcism. So you're welcome to get It's a $20 DVD. I'm giving it away. You just pay the shipping by calling 877-526-2151. I want to move on to another topic, how to deal with toxic people in your life, according to St. Teresa, the little flower. Have you had anybody in your life where you just look at them and maybe even a relative and you go, oh, no, I have to deal with, and then you put the name in. And sometimes you get so upset that you're like, it just throws you off. Well, the little flower has uh, some solutions, but I'm going to give you an example of what she did with someone who irritated her in the convent. And this was an older nun who was in the convent, in the pew, and she's trying to pray, little flowers in front of her, and she's hitting her rosary up against the pew and making this consistent noise. That was bugging the little flower. She wanted to tell that nun in the back, will you please stop hitting your rosary on the pew? It's bothering me. But then she realized that was kind of toxic for her. And then she said, wait a minute. Let me change the dynamics here. Let me offer this inconvenience for the poor souls in purgatory. So every time I'm hearing that rosary hit the pew and it's irritating me, I'm going to offer that up for the poor souls in purgatory. And I'm going to envision that souls are getting out of purgatory because I'm, I'm doing something meritorious. I'm not getting mad. I'm offering that to Jesus for the poor souls. See, that's something that is easy to say hard to do but that's a good example and have you had anybody in your life offer that up as a sacrifice to jesus and now i can tell you in my own life it's helped me deal with people like that because i've given it to jesus that's my take you know we all have toxic people in our lives there's people that we simply just don't get along with mm -hmm. or they rub us the wrong way or people who, who or, or, or people who, who seem to bring the worst out in us, and yep. there's always that person that causes us to, you know, to to feel very uncomfortable. You know, mm -hmm. they, they they bring out that concupiscence, our they are our, our fallenness, our fallen nature, and so Saint Therese, she basically mastered the art of dealing with difficult people, and she yep. learned to empathize with them. Notice that, yeah, em that's what she used. The technique she used with toxic people was to empathize with them. So here's some of the stuff that she would give, you know, uh, from her life and how she, she dealt with people. Number one, she, you know, she would say that toxic people are relentlessly negative. We know that. They find something they don't like, either true or it's made up, and, and they focus on it. Well, the prioress, for example, decided that St. Therese was lazy and continuously... <laughs> told her that she was lazy, drove that point home. Well, guess what? St. Therese, after a while, you know, when you hear that over and over, you can't help but wonder if all the criticism is correct because if you're told some, something repeatedly, you start to believe it, even if it's completely inaccurate. So that steady stream of negativity takes a toll after a while. So, you know, she would say that because they're extremely negative, toxic people, it, it, this is the way she solved the problem with her detractors. She sought, she sought her value from within. In other words, she just kept doing her work quietly, got criticized without drawing any attention to herself, and she did her work to fulfill her own sense of self-worth as a nun and as a way of honoring God. And in fact, 
She often gave others credit for the work that she actually did because she knew it would make them happy. And here's what she did. She stopped caring about whether the priorist noticed or called her lazy, and this suddenly set her free from all the negativity. So learn to ignore people that are negative. I'll give you an example. We flew back from Chicago this weekend from some meetings. And while I was at the airport, when you go through the security, uh, you know, you have to go through a certain process. And there were two doors. One was not being used. One was being used. And so I'm just following like a herd of people. You know, I do whatever they tell me to do. And the man came up to my face and says, hey, don't you know I'm telling you to you can't use that door. You have to use this door. Aren't you listening? And, and my thought was first. Hey, can't you see there's thousands of people coming through? I don't hear you. And, you know, I was ready to, I felt like telling the guy to shove it. You know, that was my lower nature. But you know what I did? I saw his name. I called him by name. And I said, I'm so sorry. I didn't hear you say that. Could you repeat that for me, please? And I smiled. And he just looked at me and he repeated it again. I said, thank you very much. But inside of me, I was saying, can't you realize that there's thousands of people here? See, what I'm trying to say is I could have gotten mad. And I could have yelled at him and maybe never got back to Los Angeles, right? Here's my point. <laughs> you get it? Because they could have said, yeah, this guy's a troublemaker. Be calm, smile, and let the guy get his point across. And don't make a big deal about things that when they when they condemn you for something that you're not even responsible for. Just say, okay, I'm so sorry. What can I do to help you? That's what I learned from this article. You can get it from the, from the IH Radio's show page the terry and jesse show because i think it's so important because the holidays are coming up yes we're going to meet more toxic people every day and i think if we have an attitude of gratitude that's welcome just about everywhere you know being a toxic person or being around toxic people it actually can help you become a saint i'm going (laughs) to be very personal here i'm going to be very personal because both of them are passed away they've gone through their eternal rest my mom and my 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 former sister-in-law both of them have passed away my sister-in-law did not like my mother at all for her entire <laughs> life, at all, for no reason. My mom was a holy, pious Catholic woman, and that rubbed my sister-in-law the wrong way. And my sister-in-law, who wasn't up to speed in her Catholic faith, well, I'll tell you one thing. My mom killed her with kindness for 30 years until she died. <laughs> and, and, and my sister-in-law was toxic to my mother. And what did that do for my mother? It made her a holier woman. Well said. If you'd like to get that interview with an exorcist DVD, you're welcome to get it for free by calling 877-526-2151. If you want Jess Romero to come to your parish or your event, go to jesseromero.com. If you'd like me to come to your event, call me at 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead here. Don't forget, hang on to the steering wheel. Don't let go. Keep your eyes on Jesus.